Welcome to Sports Talk with Steve Jones, the daily talk show with the voice of Penn State and men's basketball. You never know what special guest may stop on by any given day. Now here's the man of the hour, Mr. Steve Jones. Every time you're on, same thing. (laughs) One issue after... (laughs) What, what do you do? This was one of the more painless days with the, with the issues. Not not many issues th- today. What are you talking about? <laughs> painless days. <laughs> now, you don't understand what it's like working with you. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I've I've heard stories. <laughs> stories. I told most of them. <laughs> All right. Oh, there we go. This is the guy I wanted to send an email to anyway. Um, great to be with you. Great to be here. Um, just for a couple laughs, you know it's a Nike school, right? It's a, it is a Nike, I know. I usually wear the Nike. Yeah, I, the I can't, with you, almost I almost always wear the twirl. swoosh. <laughs> um. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I worry about you. I really do. Um. Uh, Mostly because it's just taking the whole place down. Uh, so, <laughs> I thought, you know, there's no solidarity with the Phillies anymore. No. You've bagged them. <laughs> uh, well, let me just say in, in all seriousness about the Phillies. What did I say about the Texas Rangers before the playoffs began? I said, dangerous team because if their offense is going... And it's a great offense. Mm-hmm. I said, they'll win some of those 10 4, 10 5 games. I said, they, I said, but when their offense slumped, which every offense is going to slump, mm-hmm. I said, that's why they didn't win the division because they had right. just enough slumps that cost them, including at the end of the season. It's ironic at the end of the regular season, the Rangers' offense slumped. And it allowed Houston to pass them. Now, in the end, it didn't matter. The road team won literally every game in the series, just like the 2019 World Series when the Washington Nationals won. The road game won. The road team won every game in the series. Now let's get to the Phillies. That offense clicking, 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 and also when they got to Arizona, the offense slumped. It doesn't really. It's just the timing mm-hmm. of it. It's not that they right. went to Arizona, no, and it slumped. Right, it just it turned out that the timing was it when they got to Arizona, it slumped. And I talked to Scott Fransky before Tuesday's game. I talked to him um, about maybe six hours before the first pitch, and I said, "Scott, what's your biggest concern?" He says, "Steve, the biggest concern," he says, "is like the offense." He says, "They've got to be able to hit." And I said, "I said, Scott, a big part to me is you need to be the team that takes the lead." And they never took the lead in Game Seven. They tied it, yeah, on the bone home run. Right? Well, they took the lead well, two, took to one. two to yeah, one. Yeah, start double. But it was, but, but it yeah. was like it was one of those like it, what, when I mean take the lead, I mean like take the lead like by three, four runs and bury them. Instead, they got buried. And what did Arizona do? Arizona in the first game of the series, and I'm going to go right to one guy and one guy only, Corbin Carroll. Mm-hmm. Okay, Game One. Leads off the game against Wheeler with a broken bat single to, to uh, center, right center. All right, fifty-four stolen bases, fifty-nine attempts. Hey, Arizona, let's see. Let's see. They want to get that running game going, uh-huh. and he never moved. I'm sitting at home thinking, "Wow." And I thought they'd run him right away just to get him going. Sure. You know, get get which would jumpstart the whole team. Let's see. Let's see. You know, let's see what Wheeler's like. Let's see what Real Moto is like. Nothing. I thought, geez, they're playing tentative baseball. Game two. Lead off spot again. He reaches on a Trey Turner error at short. I thought, all right, they've learned their lesson from game one. They're gonna run him here. Mm-hmm. No, he never moved. Like, I said, why are they so tentative? Now that's the game. The Phillies blew them out. In yep. Game two, I said, but they're they're 
playing so tentative. It had because the Phillies offense was in high gear, and I felt like Arizona, based on him as as really the weather vane, right? Tentative. Like, geez, if they're going to play tentative against a team that's playing like this, I said, it's going to be a sweep. Well, they were able to take two out of three in Arizona. And when they got back to Philadelphia, what did the Diamondbacks do? They ran, they ran, and they ran. And guess who led the way in running? Mm -hmm. Corbin Carroll did. Carroll, especially in Game 7. Well, Game 6, he was great. Game 7, he was phenomenal. But they're running all over the place, and the Phillies could not contain them because they they finally looked around and said, you know what, the heck with it. Let's get aggressive. Let's just go for it here. And they did. And you can now go back to the beginning of the playoffs. Which team, at least in this run, has had the best bullpen? No doubt. It's been Arizona. Yeah. They've easily had the best bullpen out of everybody. Better than Houston, better than mm-hmm. Texas, better than everybody. Uh, and that... I mean, when they finally got aggressive and said, you know what, we're going to take some chances. We're going to see how many of them pay off. And guess what? They almost all paid off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Against a great catcher, a smart catcher, pitchers who were aware. And I wonder if the pitching staff for the Phillies got a little complacent with guys on base because the D-backs weren't running. Yeah, especially, I think, the starters. Uh, you look at Game 2, especially with Nola, I thought got a little complacent. And when the Diamondbacks got aggressive, and it, you talked about it, obviously, it changes completely changes their dynamic because you play... To me, the game of baseball is reaching the point now where you have to play the style they played in Game 6 and 7. You, you've got to play that approach well, you where... Have, you have to play the approach if yeah, you have the personnel yeah, to do it. Yeah, they, absolutely. They do. Yeah, yeah, and they do. And uh, you can take that approach. They do. They were aggressive, and they scored runs because of it. You look at the hit where they took the lead. They were, well, even going back to the, the where they tied it at two. Got to second. Corbin Carroll brings them in with an, with an RBI. Mm-hmm. Stolen base. Yep. 3-2 lead. Then yep. obviously 4-2 on the, the double the on yep. the double by Marte, who's been yep. unbelievable this postseason. Sure. He's a good player. And then Carroll brought him in with the sack fly. Absolutely an aggressive team. And aggression a lot of times you know, pays off. And it certainly did for, for the Diamondbacks and for the Phillies. You felt like game five, they started to find themselves a little bit. You, you felt like the offense was clicking a little, and then part of that was Wheeler being on the mound. I think sure. he's just been incredible. And, uh, yeah, Game 6 comes rolling around. It's It felt like when the Pirates came back home against the Braves in, in 91, mm-hmm. we needed one win to wrap the series up at home. Win never came. That's right. the Phillies. You needed one win to wrap the series up right. in front of a crowd that's just been tremendous this year. Yeah. And, yeah, and win that never came. And, again, they're a great crowd. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't affect. No. But yeah. uh, as I've said a Good thousand teams. times. Especially it, in baseball. It's, 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 right. But it's... In football, it affects you. It, it's football. I think it's it's a factor. Football, hockey doesn't affect no. you. Basketball doesn't affect you. Okay, football no. does because ba- of the pre-snap communication. It affects you, and it doesn't affect you in baseball. I know we're the most intimidating crowd. You're not standing mm-hmm. next to them, screaming at them and threatening no. them. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> uh, it's just people who can or can't handle the moment. That's right. You know what it comes down to. Uh, the moment's too big for them. It's not because of the crowd. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm pitching badly. The crowd got to me. It's like, hey, no, no, no. no. Um, it, but if you want to think that when you yeah. buy your ticket, that's fine. That's, uh, yeah. that's perfectly fine. It's not a reality, but, you know. So now you get Arizona and Texas. It's interesting. The LCS numbers were great. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine the World Series numbers no. being great for Texas no. and Arizona. No, 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 not at all. I, you know, I, think, I think baseball kind of needed Philadelphia. I don't know. think there's any doubt they needed it. <laughs> and that's you know Arizona and Texas. I think the folks in Arlington obviously are going to be watching. They're starving for a World Series. I, I, they, it's you know you're one strike away twice in you know 2011. You feel like you are starving this is your chance yeah yeah for the diamondbacks i don't think there's there's any question that they're going to draw their fan base but 
beyond that, I don't I don't see anything really that would show to me that ratings are going to be off the charts, especially with the the nights that the World Series is too. Friday and Saturday, obviously. Mm-hmm. Saturday you're going to have college football. Yeah. Friday night, I think there's going to be plenty of options. Then you get to Halloween. Right. That's going to be another one that I think where the ratings are going to be tough. So I, I think the days don't help it either. Yeah. And Monday night you're going to be competing with a lot of stuff on cable. So I, I think there's yeah, to me. The ratings weren't going to be great to begin with, and the days that the World Series are, I think, probably affect it, too. I think you're going to be competing a lot with things on television. I just don't see the ratings being very high for this. No, neither do I. Um, That's it with all due respect to the fine teams that are playing in it. Um, So that's not an issue. as to you know, But it just turns out because of who it is, Mm -hmm. that is an issue. Yep. That is an issue. Michigan... (laughs) Everybody's talking about it. We've been talking about it a lot. The Astros are rejoicing. <laughs> I this can is, tell you that. Okay, again, this is your guy. <laughs> I mean, this is your the, guy. The Astros are rejoicing in a big way right now. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And, uh, yeah. the uh, Every day, something else comes out. Mm-hmm. The Washington Post story yesterday. That was a, yeah, if that's true, was, boy oh boy, was a yeah. Be honest with you, a damning story mm-hmm. um, about this whole thing. Absolutely. And it sounds like if we go back to what January, I can't remember his first name, but Weiss, the co-offensive coordinator, mm-hmm. got fired. Right. And. It was something to do with his computer in the building. If I'm reading this right. Right. And so they bring in a third uh, Yeah, yeah, that was when he uh yeah, he, Matt Weiss failed to go to the meeting. I do remember that now. Yeah. Yep. yep. Failed to go to the meeting to show what was yeah. And yep. but they took his computer. Mm-hmm. Because they needed a third party to investigate what yeah. was whatever alleged right. salacious material was on there. Mm-hmm. Right? That sound fair? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I guess in, in going through it, they then started finding stuff related to this. Uh And like, uh oh. And you're looking around and going, what the heck? I mean, every day it seems to get mm, worse. It gets worse, absolutely. And that's the odd part about it. Every day it seems to get worse. There's more information coming out. And I know John Bacon, um, there's a guy named Stapleton. That he felt um, that he feels is maybe the source of this, I, and I don't know. He, I know John. I don't know the other mm-hmm. guy. And supposedly this guy's associated as a minority owner of the Vikings too. I remember Jim had gone after the Vikings job, then told everybody that Michigan's the only place he wanted to be. I'm like going, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, you were in sure. Minneapolis yesterday. Sure, <laughs> you were in Eden Prairie yesterday uh, for a long meeting. I mean, must have had some interest. Would you? <laughs> Would you just do it as a courtesy for, yeah, nine, just courtesy. for nine hours? Just courtesy nine hour interview. Absolutely. Is it nine hour courtesy interview? Absolutely. Sure. Courtesy, courtesy keeping an eye on the Colts and Bears at the moment as yeah. we speak. And it was um and it's not like today's information is the same as yesterday. No. You're right. Like every day this week there's been mm-hmm. more added more to more. it. Okay, it was a few, and then all of a sudden, then you know, the this, this story came out from um, Pete Thamel on Monday about the tickets. Yeah, he's done a heck of a job. On the tickets this. on each side of the Penn State yep. sideline. Now, before the game, actually, Jack and I didn't know that. Somebody, I'm not going to tell you who, because we, mm-hmm. ran, we, we ran into a lot of people yeah. on Saturday morning, but we had found out about it before we went on the air. Like, oh, really? All right. Um, so it was something that was known on Saturday morning. 
So right. then, you know, I didn't talk about it until after Pete wrote the story because it's, you know, it's just the right thing to do. And and again, when you are looking at the the story now goes is that they had tickets for eight Ohio State games. And this game last Saturday mm-hmm. was going to be the fourth. Mm-hmm. On both sides of the field. Right. Because yep. this now brings mm-hmm. in Penn State. That was going to be mm-hmm. the th- that was going to be the fourth game out of eight yep. they're going to see from Ohio State. It was going to be the third game out of f- five that they're going to see Penn State. So they already have gone to two Penn State games this year, and that was going to be the third game. There were two more they were going to go to for obvious reasons as to which two they're going mm-hmm. to play. Okay. They're going to five Georgia games. Plus the SEC championship game. Like according to the Washington Post story, you know, it's it's football interns and so forth that are involved in this. And people will tell you it's so easy to break the code in the sideline. Well, it's easy to break it's the easy code. To in break. The- Cohen, the sideline, when you're concentrating when you're, totally yeah. on it, it is not easy to do during the course no, of a game. I was going to say, during an actual game itself. Okay? No. You actually have to get it back, mm-hmm. marry it to the plays, yeah. and then go from there. I mean, everybody who's saying how simple this is Mm-mm. just flat out doesn't, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay? Yeah, right. I realize in the military we have people that are breaking down mm-hmm. codes and so forth, right. but it takes time to do that. Absolutely, okay? the incredibly skilled people can do this, but they don't do it like in a in a blink. They don't do it in real time. Right. You know, they they're looking for patterns and things like that as to how it's going to be done. Well, you have to take this and marry it to video. Well, where do you get the video from? Hmm? Exactly. Right? Now, can you record the game on TV at home and do it? Sure. But you know darn well uh, this yeah. is being done from the no, internal yeah, system. The internal That's... system there, which as an employee, he's been on the staff since the spring of 2022. Mm-hmm. So he's been there a year and a half. He has complete access to. Okay. This is far more intricate yes. than people realize. Again, if I throw up a tape, and the TV copy especially, now the all-22s for the most part are pretty tight. Mm-hmm. Okay? The all-22s for the most part are pretty tight. All right? So you, you know, maybe once in a while you can get a glance, and there's, you can see maybe a signal in the background once in a while, okay? whether it's the end zone or the sideline shot. TV ones are, you know, a little wider shot and so forth. And you know, but depending on where the ball is, right? And that's why you'll see teams they'll hold up sheets when they're on the near sideline, for the simple reason is that they don't want people in the press box to see and TV. That's why they're doing it. But to have the entire book. Mm-hmm. And to have multiple games worth where, okay, let's see what they changed and who's the dummy and who's the real and who, you know, and how they change up from this game to this game based on they ran this play here, the sign's slightly different this time or it's the same. You know, like you start going through and they're using comparisons to do all this. And that's how they come up with the patterns. And I, it, it's, okay, so... They're making him out to be the total fall guy for this. Like he's a one man right. rogue operation. Yeah. Yes, there's some is there some sort of five hundred page Michigan manifesto mm-hmm. writing or whatever. Okay. But I'm sorry, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that if you were to ask me, but do you think it's just one guy? And I'm gonna look at you and say that based on no internal information right. there, but based on how I know operations work, that no. There's no way. No mm-hmm. way. Right? And you know darn well, and based on what you read about him, he's the kind of guy that you know makes the big mistake about bragging about it in the building. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're bragging about it in the building, who are you bragging about it to? The interns, or are you bragging about it to the people that are using yeah. the information higher up, trying to look great yep. to them? 
Exactly. Right. I'm just saying here. That's two yeah. plus two. No. Uh -huh. I'm trying to take two plus yeah. two and have it equal four. You add. You add an additional one to make it five. You know. You you also have to have credibility behind your story, and you start naming names, and you take names to who. Oh, I'm I'm close with this guy, this guy, and this guy. Then your story builds up even more, and you add to it. Yeah. You know, it's like. Hey, and I think, for the most part, you've heard coaches talk about coaches. All the coaches across the country have done a good job of downplaying it, big time, right? Because they just want to stay out of yeah, it completely. They want to stay out of it, absolutely, and have this dealt be dealt with at the administrative level. Yeah. So they've so they've downplayed it and so forth along the way. Nobody's come, no coach has come out and been blunt or angry right. about it. They've all been like, yeah, well, you know, the, right? because they just, all of them seem to feel that's a smart way. And I agree with them. 100%. Uh, if I'm sitting in that yeah. spot, I'm like, is, hey, well, you know what? We have to execute yeah. better. Yeah. It is, it is still, you know, whether what you read or not, and who knows what else comes out about it, it is still an investigation. I think that is the biggest part of it. You can't really. As a coach, you don't want to put yourself in a spot where you're going to comment on an investigation and have an opinion one way or another on it because suddenly, if that investigation goes the other way, your credibility is destroyed with five words suddenly. So, yeah, absolutely doing the smart thing and really taking the high road on it and for all these coaches have done and for the good reason. I mean, so Bob Stoops told Football Scoop... Um, it's terrible. It goes against everything we are about as coaches. Okay. Um, and every hour, it seems like something else uh -huh. comes up. Um, and you're talking about like the scope of this. Uh-huh. Like it seemed like it was a few games, right? Uh, now, now they may have won one UNLV, but again, remember, you know, it depends on when you play a team into the right. season. That's why when we're talking yeah. about the potential of Absolutely. eight Ohio State games yeah. being looked at. Well, they're the last game. Yeah, that's yep. game twelve. Yeah, Penn State's November. Right. Yeah, Penn State's November. So they've got you know Saturday would have been three, add in two more be five. Um, and um, David Eubin said he has four head coaches off the record. Said, you know, anonymously, not off the record, anonymously. As big as it gets, it's the biggest advantage in college football. Okay. I mean, and he says, uh, as one said, that's huge. There's no other way to say it. That's as big as it gets. It's the biggest advantage in college football, I would say. How does it get any bigger, one Power 5 head coach said? If that's what they're doing, oh, my gosh, it's huge. I really do. I don't think it can be overstated, the coach said, calling the allegations disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, the Athletics spoke with four head coaches, three from the Power 5, one from the Group of Five, and granted them anonymity to speak candidly about how Michigan allegedly recorded signals from the stadium seats that could help the Wolverines. And let's give credit where credit is due. David Eubin from The Athletic wrote this. Okay? And The Athletic, you know, I, mm -hmm. I pay for a subscription, so everybody knows. So it's a this is a paywall. Mm -hmm. um, most programs at least attempted to code opponent signals. But they used the All-22 film provided by a subscription service available to every program and examined the TV copies that are broadcast to millions. I'm telling you right now, the TV copy is a little bit easier than the All-22. A lot of All-22s are a little tighter, mm -hmm. and the reason they're tighter is yeah. because of this. Yes. Yep. All right? TV doesn't have that same obligation, so it's a little you know, wider, loosey-goosey, you know, because you know, they're not thinking about that. Okay? Um, if they were able to pair the footage up with a person filming opponent signals from the stands, a practice coaches are not used to guarding against, they would have a higher percentage of certainty of those team signals. Said a group of five head coach, it would help them win. 
Um, again, in game, if you can figure it out, bully yeah. for you. It's yeah, legal, exactly. Yeah. Right? If you can look at a tape, TV tape, all twenty-two. Sure. You know, and all twenty-twos are always sideline and end zone of uh-huh. every play. Every yeah. play, so you always get two yeah. shots of it. You can somehow figure out and see something on it. Good. Okay, that's you. Mm-hmm. Okay, you can't do this. No. Said everybody gets it off video. If you're not watching coaches' copies and doing it, you're not doing your job. You hear the on-field television mics pick up. This word is code for this, or this co- word is code for that. That's part of it. Said a Power Five coach, and coaches know. Defending their own signals being stolen is also part of the game. We have constantly tried to stay ahead of it, change them, have multiple signalers, and stuff like that, said a Power 5 head coach, because all these staffs get bigger with GAs, assistants. Said Every team's got a guy that watches the other team, tries to figure out their signals, and decide whether or not they, you want to use them. All legal. That's all legal. There's nothing wrong with that. He said earlier in his career, he worked on a staff that had an analyst assigned to review the TV broadcast of the team's game and note which signals were shown on the screen. Right? Sometimes they're there, sometimes you don't see them. Depends a lot of times on where the ball is and what the camera angles are. Okay, but you're not going to get them all. Right. When you're sitting there on the okay, filming off, you are getting all of them. Absolutely. Offense and defense, you're getting them all. Okay. Okay. Uh, he says. Those, he said, the staff was certain would be deciphered by upcoming opponents would need to be changed. And you, know, and you have home teams looking at, like, hey, let's take a look at the TV copy. What of our stuff was shown? And they'll do that. They'll take a look at it. Guys, look yeah. at our own stuff here. Let's see what's being shown. And Hey, we may have to change that one up. You can't change it up with this. No. Because you don't know. You, you don't know yeah. what they have when they have literally all of them. But in-person scouting was banned in 1994. And why was it it banned? For honorary reasons? No, to save money. Okay, that was the reason why. It's a money-saving thing. Right. Um, Georgia coach Kirby Smart told reporters he's never heard of someone going to games, filming the sidelines, and passing along the recordings. If they're using electronic devices during the game to videotape a signal person for the other team and watching the tape and matching it up, a second Power 5 coach said, that's BS and above and beyond the line. There's That's a major no-no, and every coach knows that. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to the, what the NFL does, okay, all that stuff in the helmets is encrypted. Just like headphone communication from mm-hmm. the booth downstairs is encrypted for each team. That way nobody can cross over and steal what they're talking about. It's encrypted, and that's what the NFL does. They encrypt the conversation helmets with whomever's talking to them. And those helmets go off at 15 seconds before the play. Um, Saturday against Michigan, Michigan State sometimes used a play-calling method. Some teams resort to an occasion a player ran to the sideline, was told the play by a coach, and then ran back to inform the huddle. Uh, We had our head in the sand on technology instead of embracing it. The game hasn't advanced because we dealt with COVID and NIL in the transfer portal, coach number one said. This, I'll use the word crap, (laughs) should should have been handled. The sign ceiling stuff has been going on for decades. For bowl season this year, college teams will be allowed to use communications technology on a trial basis if both teams agree. Now, of course, this will, you know, and I agree it will lead to a permanent change. Now, but yeah, there are also certain things that happen, though. Like, you can talk about, um, you still have to use signs. If you're a no-huddle team, if you're a no-huddle team, Okay. You you tell, tell, uh, you're yeah. telling the quarterback sure. what the play you want. Right. He's still going to have to signal to the wide receivers yeah, as to absolutely. what they're doing. Yep. If you're a huddle team, okay, you tell everybody in the huddle. But if you're a no huddle team, right, there's still some stuff that's going to have to go on. Okay. Um. He says. Group of five coach said he admires coaches who are always looking for an edge, but there are lines. 
Use the same advantage everyone has. Every one of your opponent's TV copies are available. All 22 is available. Do what everybody else is doing. That's the standard. And if you're going to do it, do a better job covering your backside. I used a different word. Mm. Right. <laughs> um, some player callers want information to use it. Others use it less because they feel it can hinder the rhythm of their play calling anyway. Which is fine. Like the best ones yeah. are the ones that, again. I, I've talked about this a million times. I was talking to a friend of mine this morning about this, and I said, "Look, I said, I said the best ones are the ones that can do it by feel. Doesn't mean sure. you use numbers sometimes, but um, offensively, you can signal a play. Somebody sees it, sees what the defensive signal is. You tell the coordinator what it is." And they get the quarterback's attention and change the call. Coach number two said that. The first Power Five coach said in an average game, a play caller might call what he considers 10 perfect calls based on the play an opposing offense or defense would call. But if a team knew what was coming, that number would rise dramatically and heavily impact the team's chances of winning or the final score. So, um, the simplest way to ascertain how much of a boost Michigan got from Intel, and this is more of David Ubin's story from The Athletic, again, let's give complete credit to brilliant reporting, would be watching the film of each game over the past two-plus years with a coach's eye and examining on offense and defense how often the team had the perfect play call queued up based on the opposing scheme and regardless of the outcome. On offense, certain plays are designed to be a specific defense. Knowing a coverage or identifying a blitz would be a massive advantage, a first coach said. Coach number one said, you can call the perfect plays, you know what the plays are designed for specific looks, and if you know cover three is coming, here's my menu of plays that can beat cover three. Oh, and now they're in cover four. Well, here's my menu of plays Uh we have against cover four. And if you're on defense, oh, they're running a counter. Let's call the perfect blitz. Suddenly I know where you're running around, run blitz, right? He said, some teams leave it up to a coordinator to call a perfect play to beat what an offense says. It would be very simple, coach number two said. Say we see a signal and we know it's a screen pass. Universal signal across college football is waving your hand in front of your face like you're screening your face. So you start yelling that and alert the guys that there's a screen coming. It's, it's why it can be clear to coaches when an opponent has their signals beyond just play calls. Communication like that in the field makes it obvious. Signals can be altered before games, but not too often or not too drastically because guess what you don't want to do? Confuse your own players. Okay? Hey, again, every yo, you can just change them every game. You don't want to confuse all these guys. Yeah. They're used to no. doing it like certain ways, certain patterns, or whatever. You don't want to be confusing your own people. Okay, we're gonna change up. So it's like you change them, you do change up, but that's what these tapes do. If you're doing sure. multiple games, you're seeing what the changes are. Mm-hmm. Okay, they ran this play, but they changed up as to how they did this. Now you got two options as to what. They call on that play. And if you go a third time, you got a third option as to what they, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, he says that's why programs have gone to multiple signalers on the sideline. Two of them are dummies, decoys, and one is live. You have to now figure out which one is live and which sure. one's the decoy. Okay? But if a team doesn't rotate who is live and who's the dummy signal, a team with another team's signals could quickly cross reference. An early drive and ascertain who it is. So the question is Has in person scouting been a factor in Michigan's dominance the last two seasons? The NCAA rule book doesn't specify a specific punishment or violation. Coach number one said that's a different level. When you've got a network of spies, you've taken it too far. Mm-hmm. So there you are. Yep. And they've got a network. Because, I mean, this guy can go to all the games, they sent interns. Younger people, it's um, it's wild. Yeah, it sure I mean, is. It's, it's yeah. intricate. It's wild. But again, I want to take it back 
to the building. We're, okay. As an employee in the football program, he has access and, oh, by the way, mm-hmm. other people working with him that are video people. Right. Right. And you're telling me that a couple of the coaches didn't know that, hey, wow. It'd be hard. To, it would be It'd hard. Be very be difficult hard to not to. That. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? You're now stretching the level of believability here. Agreed. A brilliant show by you. Always. It's a home game, so I'm here tomorrow. There you go. Are you here tomorrow? I don't think so, <laughs> as far as I know. Look at the ovation now. It's like, can you believe that? that I'll tell you. Oh. Waving towels. Man, oh man. You're the best. Rally towels and all. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, always kidding. I love Absolutely. Warden. Years and years Likewise. of working together. He's the best. All right. So we'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll maybe even get into the Indiana game. 